So as I think most of you know, among the many things that he did um, in his amazing career, Ned Gramlich served as deputy director and then acting director of the Congressional Budgeting Budget Office. And so uh, today's final panel, in honor of that, comprises past CBO directors, Doug holtz eakin June O'Neill, Rudolph Penner, and uh, Bob Reischauer. And we are really delighted and honored to be joined by Doug Elm Elmendorf, who is the current director of CBO. Um, uh, Ned's mission was to inform and improve public policy. Doug and his predecessors are exemplars of that mission. And so I'm going to turn it over to Doug um, and hear what we have to hear. Uh, thank you, Paul, very much. I'm delighted to be part of this event honoring uh, Ned Gramlich and to be joined by four of my distinguished predecessors as director of the Congressional Budget Office. Let me begin by introducing each of them briefly. I think they only need a brief introduction. Uh, Rudy Panner served as CBO director from 1983 to 1987. He's also spent time at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, at OMB, at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, at the Council of Economic Advisors, and the University of Rochester. And Rudy is now an Institute Fellow at the Urban Institute. Uh, Bob Reischauer served as CBO Director from 1989 to 1995, after helping Alice Rivlin uh, set up and run the organization between 1975 and 1981. Uh, Bob has spent most of the rest of his career at the Brookings Institution and at the Urban Institute where he was president for 12 years. Uh, he's also the senior fellow of the Harvard Corporation, a job that at most universities would be described, I think, just as the chairman of the Board of Trustees. Uh, June O'Neill uh, served as CBO director from 1995 to 1999. She also spent time at the US Commission on Civil Rights, at CEA, at the Urban Institute, at Brookings. June is now the director of the Center for the Study of Business and Government at Baruch College at the City University of New York. Uh, and Doug holtz aiken served as CBO director from 2003 to 2005. He's also spent time at the CEA, at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Columbia University, and Syracuse University. Uh, and Doug is now the founder and president of the American Action Forum, which describes itself as a center-right policy institute. Uh, the five of us, indeed all of us in this room, are gathered here today to honor Ned Gramlich and to honor the importance of policy research. As others have noted today, Ned was a formidable producer of policy research on many different issues. Uh, just earlier this week, for example, some of his work on the benefits of government investment and infrastructure came up in a conversation at CBO. Uh, Ned was also a formidable consumer of policy research. When he was the governor at the Fed and I was here on the staff and would talk with him, I knew that I better have a lot of facts and analysis in my head, and I better have them straight, or it was going to be an embarrassing experience. Uh, because Ned was both an excellent researcher and a wise policymaker, he was a model of how policy research and policy making fit together. He knew that good policy making was founded on policy research, and thus that getting the policy research right was crucial to getting the policy making right. And of course, the importance of good policy analysis to policy making is the reason the Congressional Budget Office exists. Congress established CBO so that it would have access to good information as it made decisions. And Congress has supported CBO uh, for almost 40 years, despite the recurring awkwardness of analysis that is inconsistent uh, with policymakers' views, because the members of Congress recognize that on balance they are better off with the analysis than without it. CBO was very lucky to have Ned for two years, uh, first as deputy director and then as acting director in the mid-1980s. Uh, Ned helped to build and sustain an organization that believes, as he did, that providing Congress with good analysis will help to generate better policies, and that better policies will help to make a better world. And that brings me back to our panelists. They're each going to offer uh, their perspective on budget and economic policies and on the process of policy making. Uh, after they speak uh, each in turn, then um, they'll get a chance to ask each other questions. Uh, I'll ask them questions, then you'll have a chance to ask them questions. Uh, so let's uh, dive right in. Um, I thought we would go in uh, chronological order of being CBO director? No. no. Alphabetical order. Alphabetical order. Or whatever is listed here. <laughs> so you would like, well, I, I, I'm OK. I want to go last. <laughs> Do you want to go first, Doug? <laughs> Would you like to start? I don't. That'd be fine. 
please go ahead. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for the chance to be here today. Um, when I left uh, graduate school uh, a long time ago, um, it was relatively unusual to have the opportunity to have a job market talk before the, the meetings of the American Economic Association. But at, at that time, I lusted after a job at the University of Michigan, and indeed I got invited out to give a, a job talk uh, prior to the meetings, and I was so happy. Uh, Ned Gramlich was the chairman at the time. I remember meeting with him and saying that we're really excited. This is great. It's going to be this is going to be a wonderful opportunity. And then I went in and I gave what was probably the single most horrific seminar ever in the history of job candidates. And I walked out and walked back into Ned's office and he sat down. He looked at me as the kindest man I've ever met. And he said, um, "You're probably never going to grace the roster of a University of Michigan event again." <laughs> I'm here, <laughs> and I'm very pleased. And, I, and he was just a fabulous, a fabulous person. I mean, on top of all of his uh, uh, professional accomplishments, and uh, to to be able to contribute something at an event that is dedicated to the principles Doug mentioned, which is the production of high quality information to help uh, policymakers understand the implications of the choices they make, is is really a, a great treat. Um, I, I believe the CBO is uh, continuing in the great tradition of producing high quality information. We're not making great decisions. I, I do want to stipulate that. Um, you know, what should we be doing from uh, a national uh, fiscal policy point of view? I, I think uh, there might be some disagreement about the specifics of policies, but we know that fundamentally we have three pieces of the budget. We have the large mandatory spending programs conventionally called entitlements, the Medicare's, Medicaid's, Affordable Care Act, Social Securities of the world, uh, and they, in particular the health programs, have been uh, documented exceedingly well by CBO to be growing more rapidly than we can sustain over the long term. Uh, we have the second class of spending programs, the discretionary spending programs, uh, which fund all the things the founders would recognize as the roles of government, the national security, basic research, infrastructure. Uh, these are uh, currently capped and shrinking as a share of the budget, um, uh, indeed projected to go to all historic lows in many cases. And then we have the, the tax code, uh, which um, I think um, there's a pretty good consensus leaves a great deal to be desired in terms of high quality tax policy. Um, so what should we be doing? We should be doing tax reform. Uh, we should be doing major entitlement reform so that these programs uh, can be put on a sustainable track and, and serve their constituents better. I mean, I, I think the part that gets missed when we start talking about the budget is that those programs are in fact not serving their beneficiaries as well as they should. I'm always appalled by the fact that Social Security is kept actually sound on the books by the promise to cut retirees' benefits 25% across the board in retirement 20 years from now. That's a disgraceful way to run a pension program. And, and so certainly we need to have a Social Security program that, that's uh, financially sustainable. But we also need to have one where people know what the deal will be in retirement, and, and we should be doing that now. And the same kinds of observations can be made about uh, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, and some of the other entitlement programs. They, they're not the high-quality programs that they can and should be, and they, they can also are, are financial dangers. Now, we're not fixing those, and we need to. Um, but w we are starving the discretionary programs. And um, uh, in the process, we are letting the legacy programs of the past literally crowd out our future because those discretionary programs are where all of the investments in the future take place. And so what we should be doing, I think, is, is, is very straightforward. Uh, we should be doing those kinds of reforms. And we're, in fact, doing exactly the opposite. We are um, failing to undertake uh, tax reform, something that, that we fail at regularly, and we are probably world-class best practice at failing in tax reform, and um, uh, it, it's troubling. And, and what will probably happen over the next couple of years is, is we'll remain roughly on this autopilot um, uh, and, and literally um, just push the, 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 the period that we come to terms with the reality further out. That concerns me a lot. Because if you look at the, the basic CBO projections about the budgetary outlook, uh, the, the current law projections are, in fact, pretty good projections now because with the gridlock and practically guarantees that's what we'll do. Um, 
if you look at those, we stabilized the debt as a fraction of GDP, and we stabilized the deficit as a fraction of GDP till roughly 2017, maybe 18. Sort of depends on on what the the economy does, and then uh, everything starts to head north. That means that the moment the next president of the United States comes comes into office. Uh, there will be an enormous urgency to come to terms with this. And the, the idea that we can do a single reform quickly, I think, is, is open to some question. The idea that we can do the multiple reforms on both sides of the budget that we desperately need that quickly makes me quite nervous. And the failure to do it, I think, sends a very bad economic policy signal. Uh, if you are standing outside the, the U.S., thinking about locating uh, uh, a plant in the U.S. or hiring people, if you're uh, thinking about the future of your operations in the United States, and you look at the rising uh, an unsustainable debt under the current law projections, you, you really have three futures. And future number one is one where these policy changes are undertaken. You control the growth in the mandatory spending. You put the debt on a stable trajectory and hopefully declining as a fraction of GDP. And, and that's a comforting future. Or you can do nothing and uh, literally run into uh, a, a sovereign debt crisis. That's not exactly a pro-growth future that would make you want to, to invest in the U.S. And the third is that you can uh, sort of muddle along and, and ad hoc, uh, in ad hoc ways never come to terms with the fundamental spending problem, raise taxes in small bits and pieces to stave off trouble, and, and over the long term really make this a, a much less attractive place for uh, investment and for expansion. That's not a particularly pro-growth future either. Given the, 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 the very difficult recovery that we've had, um, I think a, a premium has to be placed on better growth policies. And so I'm concerned about the, the political economy of where we are from a fiscal policy point of view right now. I, I think it's the number one issue facing our country. I mean, all, all CBO directors believe that, like, when they wake up in the morning. But the, I, I, I genuinely think the, the moment is, is a serious one. How do you solve that, uh, you know, the, the favored solution of all politicians in these circumstances is to blame the process, and sometimes to blame the CBO director. Um, but but I, I don't think this is an issue of process reforms. Um, I think this is a, a, a deep issue of, of leadership and of the, the willingness of people to do unpleasant things. And we haven't seen anyone willing to do that on either side of the aisle for quite some time. And so uh, I, I am, in the end, a very optimistic person. Um, uh, despite all the troubles that, that face us, we, we have, as a nation, always dealt with these things. And so I'd close by saying if, if you're looking at the politics, there, there could be some leading indicators of, of how we get do better than we were doing in the moment. And, and for me, the, the key leading indicator would be suppose Republicans in the Senate, Republicans do in fact regain control of the Senate. Then I would argue that the most important question will be how will they govern? Will they in fact invite Democrats into the process pass bills that have an uh, input from both sides and the chance that the president will sign them, or will they make a point for two years in the interest of uh, the 2016 presidential election and nothing gets done? So we're going to find out. And I, I think that's one of the most important things for everyone in this audience and any audience to be looking for going forward. But the, the most important thing is to say that I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I wish Ned was here. He was, as everyone has said, wiser than than uh, I certainly am and, and probably could have fixed this all. And so uh, we miss him dearly. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, Sajun, please. Um, uh, sitting here, I've sort of changed what I was going to say. What I originally had planned to talk about was um, the problems of prediction and uh, forecasts in which are extraordinarily difficult, especially when it comes to economic matters. But um, I, I think that what might be of more interest, I had the fortune or misfortune of having worked both at CA for a while as well as at CBO and twice, once in different capacities. Um, originally when CBO was rather new, I was um, I was head of one of the units of budget analysis. Well, at that time, CBO was smaller, so I did human resources, but that covered uh, welfare, labor, Medicare, Medicaid, veterans, um, uh, and some other stuff. It was, but it was, um, and that, that was an extremely interesting experience. And um, actually, one of the things that I, that I worked on then 
is something that is still not resolved. It had to do with Social Security. Um, should we have wage indexing or price indexing? And I wrote a paper about it, but it's still, um, it obviously, the long run in Social Security is, as Doug has said, you know, that's not only Social Security, but the major, all our major, um, you know, programs of that sort are, are really key. The long run deficit is because of the problems related to Social Security and Medicare, probably more than any other thing, Medicaid, not so much. But um, um, there, there is an enormous difference between the White House, working for the White House, and working for Congress. Um, I, w I was at CEA when Nixon was president, and I was a fairly recent PhD graduate, and um, um, I was fortunate, actually. It was an, a very exciting experience. Nixon was president and um, had panicked when the unemployment and inflation rate went up. They were each just around, this is 1971, they were each around 6%, and the election was coming up in 1972. You know, as I've remarked to some people, I think Nixon was one of the few people in the country who really believed that McGovern had a good chance of being elected. Uh, but <laughs> in order to ensure it, and I think this is an example of the, Nixon was an extremely intelligent man, um, but politics outweighs and your own your political survival and that's because I think in his case he really believed that he could do really good things and should be president um, so what did we get well he was seduced by Arthur Burns into the idea that the Fed could be used to increase that his that his reelection would be guaranteed if, I don't know if he exactly said those words, but that was sort of the essence of what we all gathered, the, the folks of us on, on the staff at CEA, um, that Arthur Burns had said, well, I'll, I'll pump up the money supply and that will get the economy going. There is a danger of inflation and you will sol solve that with incomes policy, which was then in vogue, and we could have a wage and price freeze and that'll take care of that. And, um, no one thought that this would really be done, but it was done. And um, I, was, I, I remember exactly when it happened. It was in August of 1971. Everyone was shocked. So we got, in, we, we got wage, a wage price um, freeze, and the next year, inflation and unemployment dropped by half. So it might have seemed like a great thing to do initially, but then um, the predictable problems arose, um, shortages everywhere, you know, it, and, and eventually I think it put a pull on growth in the economy for um, at least a decade. It, it, it really, it, it ended up causing slowdowns. But um, there is, from the perspective of the White House, uh, one thing was that uh, the president was very accessible to the chair of the CEA. They, um, and we were physically in the old executive office building, so we were close. And then af I stayed on w during the Ford administration when Alan Greenspan was the chairman, and he too, um, he, had quite, he had a close relationship with Ford. Uh, and even though Nixon didn't follow, I'm sure it was not it was not the advice of McCracken or Herb Stein to have, they, they argued otherwise, but um, um, they, they did have contact with the president. And, um, but we were allowed quite a bit of latitude actually in writing the economic report. I think that um, um, the staff were serious economists and uh, um, the chapters in the economic report um, I actually, Barry Chiswick and I had written uh, several chapters jointly, and we we did put the chapters together to make a, to make a book. So it was um, um, we we were encouraged to do um, to do research, genuine research, such as would be done for a journal article or in a university. Um, Congress, on the other hand, is a totally different uh, type of thing. You are not you are not employed by a particular person. Um, 
I, when I was appointed director, um, it, it became sort of, it was, it, was, it was a highly political choice. I, I didn't know any of the people who were interviewing me. I had no political connections, but um, um, I was, <laughs> it, this was, I was believed, I think, by Newt Gingrich, who was sort of leading the search, that I was a conservative woman, which was true. I, I, I conservative, I would be considered a conservative economist, sort of a Chicago type person. And Rush Limbaugh had endorsed me. I, I never <laughs> met, <laughs> so I guess maybe that's <laughs> that's what did it. But um, um, at any rate, um, the Congress itself is. You have all of these people, all of whom are worried about their political futures, and all of have different kinds of constituents. So, um, although we are so at CBO, we're some we're removed. We don't have members want coming into our offices telling us what to do. I don't think you have <laughs> that. That doesn't happen. But um, they. Um, but it's, it's, it's a difficult situation, and you do learn a lot. One of the things is that, you know, as Doug has said, as economists we know what has to be done, but how can you c convince people whose futures might be ruined if they, if they followed particular advice? You know, for example, it's, I think the one real problem is when it comes to the different, the different possibilities for um, changing Social Security, it's, it's very complicated. It's hard to explain to people what it would actually mean. So it's very easy for someone who's opposed to it to terrify the public. Um, um, so they'll say, oh, they don't understand that if nothing was done, their benefit, and that seems far in the future, their, their benefits would all be cut by 25%. They can be easily, um, led to think that um, they themselves along the way will have much lower benefits than their parents or grandparents or anybody else had had. Um, Newt Gingrich was um, constantly tormented. He had actually some good ideas for Medicare, but as soon as he began talking about them, they were sort of al along the lines of Medicare Advantage plans. Um, he was, he was easily sort of vilified, and there was a TV ad that showed him morphing into some horrible monster you know, as he talked about reforming Medicare. So um, I think that um, it's, the difficulties of doing it, of course, shouldn't stop um, um, those of us who, you know, who have some insights into the program for trying, you know, for doing the best research that we can, um, and convincing as many members as we can to go along, but um, uh, the politics of the situation really cannot be ignored. I was personally dragged in with the Fannie, F um, CBO was one of um, a few um, organizations that was asked to a study Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and we did, and we, and the paper, we, very, Marvin Faup, a very good analyst at CBO, had written an excellent report about Fannie. When it, but I, when I came to testify at the banking subcommittee that was the oversight for Fannie and Freddie, um, what I f was faced, well the staff, there was a very <laughs> brave person chairing the subcommittee, but, and his staff was friendly, they called me and said, you watch out, watch out, because when you get there, every member of that subcommittee has been sent a draft of something they should read that was written by the staff at, at, um, at Fannie Mae. And they're all, of course, just trying to destroy our, our, um, our study. Um, but, and, and that was the case. The various, the various members of that subcommittee that had the direct oversight of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were all receiving um, generous contributions from, from Fannie Mae, and they were not about to cross them, at least not publicly. Um, so it made it difficult to, uh, to do any reforms. So that's, you know, one, ex and oh, not, Fannie Mae did not stop there. They sent, we were, I and a few other staffers at CBO met with um, Vice President 
um, of Fannie Mae and, and a couple of vice presidents. And they came in, it was sort of like a visit from the mafia. They, uh, they said, you had better not release, that. it had not been publicly released, the report. And they said, you had better not release this report, or you will be sorry. They didn't say exactly what they would do, but <laughs> they, they, it, they tried to be as menacing as they could. They also took out ads in the newspaper that said CBO or a bunch of digit brains and pencil heads or something like that. Well, I, am I out of time? We probably shouldn't move on. Okay. But I'm enjoying the story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm throwing hearing happening to somebody else. <laughs> oh, I did have Not one serious, serious thing to say, and uh, um, that was something in, in thinking about um, my talk here of, of a, on a serious side, is that um, one of the things that will make forecasting of the future difficult is that the elderly population have been changing. I don't know how widely that information has been disseminated, but they're much more likely to work um, they're much more educated, and they're richer. Um, they have they're more assets, and uh, so I think that the, in in the minds of many people, I certainly the press that writes about it, they they envision this this social security recipients as being widows who are totally impoverished and depend totally on social security. But that picture, although I, it exists, and certainly the lower quintiles of those receiving social security may fit that description, but social security recipients that are coming along the way are not, are not in that mode. They're, they're a different type of group. Thank you very much, Judy. Uh, Rudy, please. Well, it certainly is an honor to be here uh, at this uh, conference remembering Ned. Uh, he was such a great guy, and we had a fine time together. Uh, when he served as my deputy at CBO in the mid-1980s. Um, as Doug implied, there is some temporary good news on the, on the fiscal outlook. The deficit is less than one-third as a proportion of GDP than it was in 2009. Uh, the long-run outlook has improved some because of a, a pause in, in health care cost growth. Um, but it'd be sacrilegious for anybody in the buz budget business to be happy. Um, <laughs> you have to point out that CBO's baseline has the deficit increasing again after 2015, and uh, I think there is some evidence that uh, at least some of the pause in health care growth is a very temporary phenomenon. I really do strongly believe that um, if an if a new president after 2016 was at all far-seeing, he or she would make a full court press to resolve the long-run budget problem. Otherwise, you're just going to see a lot of floundering. Uh, it'll be very hard to mount initiatives and things like infrastructure, education, or much of anything else with a debt-GDP ratio hovering in the 78, 80% range and threatening to rise. Now, I say that fully expecting that the severe caps on discretionary spending will, in fact, be relaxed, perhaps as early as 2016. Uh, but even if they are relaxed, they will remain very, very tight, uh, absent a thoroughgoing fiscal reform that starts to restrain health spending and Social Security. Do I actually expect the next president to make a full court press? Um, in that regard, um, probably not, but it is interesting to dream, and there's, there'll be a lot of dreaming in this talk. Um, being so depressed by the current situation with regard to fiscal policy, I have turned to studying fiscal history a lot. Um, I don't think you can exactly emulate the past, but you can identify characteristics of of uh, past successes and failures uh, that might, just might, um, help to push things along uh, currently. Uh, to me, uh, really the ideal reform of the past was not a broad fiscal uh, consolidation, but rather uh, the Social Security reform of 1983. Uh, it was provoked by the trust fund going broke. That was deemed a crisis. It did scare a lot of old folks, 
but it was a nice crisis in that it really didn't hurt anybody directly economically. It could have been solved by a modest infusion of general revenues, but that would have radically changed the philosophy of Social Security, which gained so much of its political clout uh, by creating the illusion that everyone pays for their own benefits. Well, President Reagan responded by proposing a rather dramatic cut in the benefits of early retirees, and that met a total firestorm. So he created the bipartisan Greenspan Commission, uh, which was supposed to solve the problem. Now, it's often said that this is one instance in which a commission seemed to actually work, uh, but that's probably a false lesson. In fact, the full commission uh, got absolutely nowhere. If you look back at the rhetoric, the Republicans seemed as adamantly against any tax increases as they are today and the Democrats strongly opposed uh, benefit cuts. Uh, it was only when a lump group, or <coughs> excuse me, a rump group, <laughs> was created under uh, the skillful leadership of Senators Moynihan and Dole uh, that progress was made with a, with a mix of payroll tax increases and benefit slowdowns that uh, appeared balanced in the short run. And, and looking at that history, it's really surprising to me how the rest of the commission went passively along with this rump group, except for a very few Republican senators who still objected to the tax increases. Uh, nevertheless, that commission only made the, the system financially sound for 50 years instead of the 75 years that uh, was the tradition of the system. And it was J.J. Pickle, a member from Texas, who engineered the most important single reform outside of the committee, on the floor of the House, by very gradually increasing the normal retirement age. And that did make the system whole, at least temporarily, for 75 years. Now, the chairman, Alan Greenspan, will tell you that the whole effort wouldn't have gone anywhere were it not for a silent agreement between President Reagan and Speaker O'Neill that neither of them would oppose the recommendations uh, made by the commission. So I think that the main lesson from all of this is not that commissions can be successful sometimes, but that bipartisanship can be very successful if you really work at it, as did Senators Dole and Moynihan and President Reagan and Speaker O'Neill. The latter two had lunch almost every week, a practice that might have served the current president very well. Even once a month might have helped some. Um, and I know that a lot of people uh, might say that attempts at such cooperation would be futile today given the intense partisanship. But if one looks back at 1983, the rhetoric was really intensely partisan. I think the main difference is that there were people who were then much more willing to deal with one another uh, than we see today. Well, another bipartisan effort at fiscal consolidation occurred in 85 with Graham Rudman Hollings. Um, with the fact of the phased in Reagan tax cuts that had been passed in 81 and the defense buildup, the Congress didn't do very much between 1982 and 1984 but raise taxes and try to limit domestic spending growth. And that was a very unpleasant uh, range of activities. And after all of that, they were quite frustrated by the fact that the deficit didn't come down. Um, and it was Phil Graham who came up with this radical plan to specify declining targets for the deficit and to enforce them with across the board spending cuts. The, the deficit targets were based on our medium-term uh, deficit forecast. And even though our error in an optimistic direction was really quite modest compared to usual forecasting errors, uh, achieving the targets was much harder politically than the Congress originally anticipated. Uh, they, in fact, loosened the targets once and then confronted by a gigantic sequester in 1990, uh, they backed off and um, they went into 
something that Bob knows very well, arduous uh, negotiations at Andrews Air Force Base that came up with a plan of spending the restraint and tax increases, but a plan that was promptly defeated on the floor of the House. The plan was finally tweaked by a group of a few leaders and ultimately passed. Um, so one can ask whether the summit was a, a, a necessary preamble to the eventual agreement. Uh, one can ask whether some kind of summit, a large summit or maybe a small summit of, of leaders, uh, would work today. I think few would think it possible, but we did come sort of close with the Boehner-Obama agreement uh, prior to the fiscal cliff that soon fell apart, unfortunately. I think a clear technical lesson from Grand Rudman Hollings is that if you want to automatically trigger actions to achieve some fiscal policy, uh, the deficit is a terrible variable to use as a trigger. It's just simply too hard to forecast, it's too volatile, and it's controlled by outside forces and only a little bit in the very short run uh, by laws that the Congress passes. Once they established the 90 agreement, uh, they had the wisdom to pass the Budget Enforcement Act, which made sure that that agreement wouldn't erode through time. And with that act and its pay-as-you-go rules and its spending caps, the Congress specified targets that they had direct control over, as opposed to this deficit thing, which uh, kept getting out of control. Uh, but it's important to point out the act was truly an enforcement vehicle. It was not something that reduced the deficit by itself. Uh, when the act took form under the leadership of Lee and Panetta, I'm afraid that I testified against it in the Budget Committee, uh, arguing that it would never work because it was totally fraught with loopholes. Uh, but in fact, it worked very well, and the Congress did not exploit those loopholes till the late 1990s when uh, they were confronted uh, by a budget surplus totally by surprise. Well, those efforts at fiscal consolidations were followed by the 93 and 97 deals. The former was purely partisan in the sense that it only got Democratic votes, and the Democrats suffered mightily as a result of it in the 94 election. It really tells me that any party trying to foster a budget deal should really bend over backwards to try and get some cooperation from the other party. Uh, it's become a cliché to say that significant progress will only be made uh, if the two parties join hands and jump off the cliff together, but it is a true cliché, I'm afraid. And I think both parties have learned the lesson, unfortunately, that uh, it is politically perilous to attempt anything alone. So what we need is a very strong political leadership and the courage to reach across the aisle, and whether that's forthcoming uh, is a total mystery at this point. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rudy. Bob, last we've come to the end of the alphabet, so you have to <laughs> yeah. go now. We could go to the audience, <laughs> and then I can. Uh, <coughs> you've heard from the optimists. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I just want to start with a few uh, rec reflections uh, from a personal standpoint uh, with respect to N Ned. Uh, he and I were pretty good friends. Uh, we played tennis together. We played volleyball together, smattering of other sports. Any of you who knew Ned realized if you put a racket or a ball or a bat in front of him, he would want to play. He'd begin suiting up. Uh, and uh, so we had a lot of fun, uh, and uh, we were both colleagues of each other, both at Brookings in the early 70s, and uh, then again at the Urban Institute uh, three decades later. And I might add that the book that everybody's been talking about uh, was uh, largely written while he was at the Urban Institute, and uh, we published it, and we're very proud uh, <coughs> of uh, that uh, uh, book and having Ned as our colleague. Um, Ned and I were also interested in a lot of the same uh, kinds of policy issues and broader uh, issues that faced uh, society and the world. 
in the policy space, we uh, had common interests in poverty and income distribution, community development, fiscal federalism, and of course the federal budget. Uh, I'm sure each one of you has a, a different group of, uh, of topics that uh, you and Ned, in a sense, shared. And if we put them all together, we'd probably have the encyclopedia of important public policy issues. And we'd have a few pages, each of us, but uh, Ned would be cited on every one of the chapters because uh, he was so amazingly broad. Uh, in the non-economic uh, related space, uh, we spent uh, time discussing a wide variety of things, uh, including uh, how to manage uh, shared family summer homes when the adult children and the grandchildren of the original owners uh, have very different interests in, in the property and very different economic and uh, economic capacities and skills that they can bring to sustaining uh, the property, which actually turns out to be a, a complex issue on which many books have been written. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, I was opining on these, and Ned was reading the books, and <laughs> uh, which was so uh, uh, typical of him. He came to uh, the argument with expertise, uh, and uh, I often didn't. Uh, we also spent a lot of time discussing alternative financial models for elite institutions of higher education in a world in which uh, federal research spending is declining, uh, tuition uh, increases are limited by slow growth of, uh, of uh, incomes and uh, uh, growing student aid policies and endowments uh, aren't increasing the way they did before. Uh, everybody got uh, wise about uh, the uh, uh, modern way to invest. Uh, it seemed to me that there was no, uh, the answer to no interesting public policy question that Ned couldn't add value to. Uh, he was a natural teacher, as many of you know, and extremely generous with his time to his colleagues. I mean, the amount of time he spent uh, uh, commenting on papers or uh, advising you on research outlines uh, was just uh, amazing. Uh, but uh, what always impressed me most about Ned uh, is you had this guy who was uh, very sof sophisticated methodologically and very well trained uh, who could have easily gone off and uh, been uh, uh, great theoretical uh, contributor to the field. But what he wanted to do was make a difference in policy and policies that were practical, that were politically viable, were implementable. And uh, that's what, you know, students at this, at Michigan, uh, I think, are striving for. And that's what uh, CBO has uh, been uh, uh, applying. Um, now, I had assumed that since I was listed last, I would uh, uh, be last. Uh, and everything worth saying would have been said at least twice and probably three times before I came uh, up. Uh, and if I had thought of something new and different from what they were going to say, it would probably be wrong. So I should uh, probably keep my mouth shut. But then uh, I uh, listened to them and I realized I learned a whole lot. I thought I was, I, I'm the only Democrat, by the way, on this uh, list, I think. Uh, but not to uh, appeal to your. Uh, your uh, sympathies. Um, uh, I mean, we're talking about the underprivileged. You know, <laughs> uh, you know I re realized that I really did learn something. I learned from Doug, something new from Doug, that uh, the Republicans are going to win the Senate, right? Uh, and I learned from June uh, that, uh, you know, wage and price indexing are still an issue that we're going to uh, resolve in the future. Uh, so a lot of people will be interested in that. Uh, but uh, what I thought I would do, uh, since I didn't want to repeat them, is uh, just add a little color by looking back uh, rather than forward uh, to the period where Ned was uh, Rudy's deputy and then acting director and reflect on uh, the differences and the similarities uh, in the uh, budget world at that time. And of course, the most stark difference then versus now is that uh, then we had a political system which, while it wasn't without its frictions, as uh, Rudy has mentioned, uh, was not totally dysfunctional. Uh, and we have a totally dysfunctional political system now. Uh, and uh, it was able to uh, 
pass important legislation, some wise, some not so wise, uh, that was then signed by uh, the president. Uh, we had the fix to Graham-Rudman. We had the uh, Tax Reform Act of 1986. Um, we had uh, budget resolutions that actually passed. They didn't pass on time, but uh, they still were passed before the fiscal year ended, uh, which is uh, <laughs> not always nice. Uh, there wasn't uh, a huge amount of harmony, uh, and uh, there's certain similarities uh, in the three years there, uh, you know, 86, 7, and 8. Uh, absolutely no appropriation bill was passed before the fiscal year began. So, uh, you know, that's similar to the world in which we are uh, now in. Uh, there were government shutdowns. There were two government shutdowns uh, in that period. People forget this, 86 and 87. Uh, but they were short, uh, three days each. Uh, most of the days were over the weekend, so uh, there wasn't a huge disruption one way or another. These were the days of, as Rudy said, the Graham Rudman Hauling sequestration. I was rummaging around in my shelves uh, in my office, and I came across the Office of Management and Budget and Congressional Budget Office Joint Sequestration Report signed by Ned uh, and Jim Miller the <laughs> III, uh, which uh, goes through all of the accounts uh, that we have here and uh, shows you that the 19% uh, non-defense discretionary across the board cut uh, took $3.4 million out of CBO's uh, $17.8 million budget and a proportional amount out of it. Of course, it never went into effect, uh, but I'm uh, actually going to Antiques Roadshow right after this <laughs> with, with this. Uh, if I don't get a get better a offer, uh, <laughs> I actually have the one you signed, too. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, as Rudy said, uh, we had a system. It was crazy. Uh, I've written a couple of papers that suggest that a lot of the criticism of Graham Rubin Hollings is sort of overstated because it did moderate uh, the growth uh, of uh, discretionary spending rather significantly from the trend line uh, that it was on, uh, even though uh, with a very few um, instances did it, did it or the BEA uh, have a uh, direct uh, impact. Um, so, uh, what's another difference uh, between then and now? I think uh, we're, we were a lot more innocent about the future back then. Uh, CBO did projections that were five years long. Uh, OMB did too. Uh, CBO didn't do its multi-decade uh, long-term projections. Uh, and the baby boom's retirement was still a quarter of a century away. Uh, so we weren't uh, obsessed with that. I mean, the assumption was, well, some, sometime uh, in the not too distant future, something uh, will happen. Uh, we had a new tax uh, structure that uh, I think people thought maybe uh, would uh, lead to uh, incentives that uh, help the economy and thereby uh, generated more revenue rather than that we would be into uh, a decade of undoing each part of it that we could and uh, squashing whatever uh, effects those uh, incentives might have. Um, it strikes me that, uh, you know, we didn't have a consensus on policies that would get us out of this problem because we weren't looking at the long uh, run future. Now we do. It's the expert elite uh, in the country, I think, is pretty much uh, on the same page, not of the exact policies, but of here's two or three approaches. Uh, but uh, the probability of our political system responding to that is as close to zero as one can find. Uh, and, you know, hope as I do that uh, uh, Rudy is right. Uh, you know, the fact of the matter is when you have a relatively narrow balance of power between the two parties uh, and uh, 
the almost uh, and a change in communication which allows uh, uh, through modern uh, media disinformation uh, to get out rapidly uh, strong views to be shared even if they're by small groups of people they can appear to be like a wave uh, the uh, perception by politicians is that if you are strong, if you are uh, courageous, as Rudy said, you'll also be gone uh, at the next election. And uh, that uh, certainly has been the recent historical truth. And so I think uh, if we want to talk about the future of um, uh, fiscal and budgetary policy, you probably need uh, political scientists and psychologists up here, not s former CBO directors. That's it. On that cheery okay. note. <laughs> so can we go now? Yes. Yeah. No, 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 not yet. Um, so I have some questions I'd like to ask all of you, but do you want to start? Do you have questions or comments for each other that you'd like to dive in with, or can I? Can I ask? So, so, so the first thing I was going to ask is you all talked a little bit about the views of policymakers and their willingness to compromise. and their, um, But can we talk a little bit about the views of their constituents, which goes to this question about how brave they would have to be. So we know that the basic arithmetic of the budget is that to put the federal budget on a sustainable path, we will need to either cut current law benefits from the largest, most popular uh, benefit programs or raise taxes notably above their historical share of GDP, or both. So, but if you ask people, regular people, not CBO di directors, uh, what they like about the government, they want to keep the big benefit programs, they want to keep taxes low, they want to make the cuts some other place. Um, but the other places, as we know, don't have the money <laughs> that is needed. So what is it that could change that? What element of that, of those basic pieces, Will, will voters ultimately be willing to support? Will they actually support cuts in Social Security and Medicare benefits relative to current law, recognizing they may be higher benefits than people are getting, actually getting today? Will they be willing to raise taxes above their historical share of GDP? Because if you can't do either of those things, then you can't solve the problem. Well, if they're described, I, I'm sorry. Yes, please. If they're described simply as cuts, people will say no. But I've suggested when anybody has asked me, you know, how, you, you, I think it would be more useful if people saw what monthly benefits or annual benefits would look like under different schemes. And you can do it in like current dollars so that it's something that people can understand. Um, it would, it would um, help enable people to understand what's actually happening because it's, None of the proposals would slash benefits to such an extent that people is what people imagine they would be cut to. Um, most of them, in most cases, they would be going up, and you know if they were if they were adjusted in in uh, today's dollars, uh, you know. But uh, see, they have to get maybe gifted writers or cartoonists or somebody <laughs> who could portray what the policy is exactly so that people will know is this a, a, t a terrible idea or is it good and what the benefits would be other, you know, otherwise to the economy. People might not be that enchanted by benefits to the economy, but some of them would be. Are they? But you also have to convince them that doing nothing is going to create harm. And, uh, you know, they basically, you look around and you say no. And you say, what's the problem? The problem is there's too much unemployment. The problem is we need to invest more in infrastructure. The problem is one that's going to be solved by making the deficit worse. Uh, but the other so, thing, as Doug mentioned, the real cliff that's, that's embedded in the current Social Security law, when, when the fund is exhausted, it's a it's, you know, it's a huge cut. It's not <laughs> a bigger cut than right. any of their proposals. So uh, I have yeah. a, oh, go ahead, Rudy. Well, there have been other countries where they have turned it around. Um, they maybe had disadvantages over what we have done, but if you take my home country of Canada, they did totally turn around public opinion in the mid, oops, sorry, 
they they did uh, turn around public opinion in the mid 1990s from a situation uh, where the public was cheering on spending to one where it's really hard uh, for a political party to advocate anything other than a balanced budget these days. If you talk to politicians up there as to how they did it, they had an argument that we don't have uh, because the Fed people here are keeping interest rates so low. But they, uh, they reached a situation where interest was absorbing 40% of their revenues. And the politicians of both parties made a big deal of this and it really convinced the public that it wasn't great to borrow under those circumstances. So uh, what we really need is a big increase in interest rates, you've had people. <laughs> well, you came so, to the right place. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, uh, a couple of thoughts. I mean, first, I, I think that's too strong. I mean, one of the things that I've fallen in love with, which I, I love the story about uh, Ned and the, the, the CRA uh, asking, uh, the examiners, you know, what the truth was. I, I, I think it's very useful to ask people. And so I now spend a lot more money on polls at my think tank. I never thought I would. And it turns out that if you ask people, you don't get the caricature that, that you would, would suggest. Um, you know, the most recent example, this is actually an immigration reform. It's not a budget issue where, you know, we polled Steve King's district. Um, and um, his constituents would say, the system's broken, we agree with all these policy issues, um, but most importantly, they would say, I will vote for someone with whom I disagree on immigration. They're not gonna lose their job. And this has come through in polling we've done on Medicare reform, Social Security reform as well. So I think the notion that there's this automatic punishment is, is uh, overstated. Like, you know, on the ground it doesn't look like it's there. Second point is, it does matter how you frame it. If you just say, we're gonna do this, without saying because the alternative is this dangerous path which um, will harm your children and their children and the children thereafter um, where the Pentagon says that this large amount of uh, uh, debt and our, our trajectory is our single greatest national security concern. If you, if you frame it you know, with, a, with the counterfactual being something important, that, that you get different answers. There's no doubt about it. And so they need to be educated, which is the third point. You know, the greatest thing that elections do in the United States is they are the moments of public education. It is very difficult f to, you know, get people to, to, correctly difficult to get people to stop paying attention to all the things in their lives and, and worry about Medicare reform. I mean, they, they don't do that. I mean, you, I'm sure you've had this experience. I've give, I gave lots of speeches when I was a CBO director, and I remember going to the Dallas Morning Club or something and explaining how the world was going to end, and they were outraged when they said, why haven't you said this? I said, I say it every day. I mean, you know. In elections, instead of saying to people, he wants to cut Medicare and portraying this, throwing Granny off the cliff, and she's very tough, she comes back every election, um, <laughs> it's going to have to be a, con a genuine conversation about how we're going to have to change Medicare, and the only question is how. And, and the numbers are getting to the point where that has to happen at some point, so I, I think that's optimistic. And then the last point is we're going to, again, get the test case. We're going to get the trigger because the Social Security – DI fund is going to bankrupt in two years. And so we're going to have a relatively small but important entitlement that's going to be need some fixing. And so we'll see how it plays out. You know, I'm going to come back uh, on my blog or my uh, thing and I'm going to say, and he just told you that uh, Medicare is going down the tubes and uh, we got to do something about it. Did you know that uh, in 2012, Per beneficiary, Medicare expending, uh, spending in nominal terms rose by four tenths of a percentage point, and in 2013 it was flat zero. And you know, there, I can tell you why that's all irrelevant uh, and, and all like that. But my guess is there's more people out there willing to listen to that message than to your message. We will see. <laughs> I, I want to just say one thing uh, to Bob Avery to make him feel a little better. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, he told the story about uh, Ned kicking him under the table, and it was because Ned fell asleep. Uh, and I thought, you know, well, that's pretty uh, damaging to your ego. You're, you're talking, <laughs> and your boss falls asleep because uh, uh, he thinks it's so boring. Uh, Ned, as some of you might know, Ruth certainly does, fell asleep at exciting times, too. Uh, and uh, I have a story on that. He and I were out in uh, uh, Los Angeles uh, 
at I think it was a RAND conference, and uh, we uh, left the motel to go to a uh, to the dinner, and uh, he had rented a car, and uh, we're going down the expressway at uh, you know 65 miles an hour, and you know the car <laughs> you know <laughs> begins going over the side, and I said, Ned, you know, he, oh, come on. <laughs> drive like that, and then it began going over to the side again. And then uh, suddenly he just drove over to the breakdown lane, and he got up and he said, you drive, I'm going to fall asleep. Uh, and uh, it was pretty exciting at that time. <laughs> and, and he said, wake me up when we get to the restaurant, which is what I did. <laughs> but. So can I, can I build, Bob, only your comment was, if you talk to people about the budget, they say, well, that's not the biggest problem. They're worried about unemployment. They're worried about something else. So the question I want to ask all of you is a sort of sacrilegious question coming from a director of the Congressional Budget Office, because as Doug noted, our job is to wake up worrying about the budget. Um, but um, have policymakers devoted the right amount of attention to the budget deficit and projections of the deficit and debt over the last few years? Because the question is put to me, um, is put to me often in the form, well, um, the deficit is not the biggest problem. We're not likely to make much progress on it. Uh, and the focus on it has crowded out policymakers' attention to a whole set of other issues on which progress might have been made. So, what are we, so I, my answer, of course, is I don't make policy recommendations being the CBO director. So I don't have to tell them what they should focus on. But what do you think? Progress might have been made without spending more money. <laughs> well, I, so, I, well so, I, so I'm asking you to to offer your sense of this. I mean, so I've heard you, Doug, testify that we've made essentially no progress right. on budget issues. Yeah. So does that mean that the time has been misspent, or is it just that it takes us a long process and you just spend a lot of time talking about it and educating people, and that's what we've been through in the past few years? I, th I think it's a little of both, I mean, to be honest. Um, uh, one of the, the, the problems has been that we had this tremendous success in the late 90s, and Many people thought, well, we'll just do that again, right? We, we, we went from deficits to surpluses, and the, the difficulty was we also had a, a productivity boom. We didn't know where it came from. That was awesome, and the revenue just roared in. Um, the, the baby boom was 25 years away from retiring. We had uh, uh, discretionary spending as the dominant part of the budget, and you, and you could you know, put, put the caps on there. And we got a peace dividend to help smooth out everything. And that's all gone. <laughs> but we ran the same playbook. We have this discretionary focus and, and in a different environment. Um, and so that's the part that was misspent, right? Just sort of they, we finally got their attention. They paid attention to the budget. They looked at the history, and they misapplied it, and that happens. Um, then there was the, what I think the productive laying the groundwork was, was, you know, through things like, you know, not, not because you light, might like the, the Paul Ryan budget in the House, but because of its focus, people really did have to come to terms with, well, what do we think about when we think about really doing tax reform? What do we think about when we think about the mandatory spending programs? By the time they got to that, they were so exhausted they didn't do anything with it. But I, I, don't, I don't think that was time that was misspent, really. I don't. It's just that we, we started off on the wrong direction. Bob mentioned all the things that have changed. Uh, over the decades since I was at CBO, certainly. But um, I think one of the frustrations I had already, which, which has gotten a lot worse, is that, frankly, it was very hard to get a congressman to focus on policy issues in private conversation. They were so darn busy raising money that they really had not all that much time to contemplate uh, uh, policy issues, and I, I think that's a lot worse now, that the amount of time they actually spend thinking about policy is just a limited portion of their day. Um, did, did you mean um, the difference between budget issues and other things like the thing that always bugs me is when someone says, I can bring you jobs. Well, members of Congress, <laughs> Um, I mean, they might be able to create an atmosphere where jobs would be created better, but um, nobody really knows how to, how to do it. That's something that really has to emanate from the private sector. You have to have sort of an, atmos uh, an economic atmosphere where um, individuals who, are, who can have businesses are, you know, feel it's to their advantage to start businesses. And, um, but 
it, it, there's nothing, there's no act that Congress can pass, I don't think, that can make that happen. Um, so, and as Doug said, the CME days of the 90s were entirely, and actually, there were one reason why the CBO forecast was wrong every year. We never, we were always behind because we, we didn't imagine that year after year the market would go up and up and up and, <laughs> and would bring in tons of revenues. And another thing is once we got the surplus, it turned out, I think, to be more ruinous than, <laughs> than the opposite because, uh, uh, you know, it was just spending like crazy at, on programs that you then can't just shut off. So uh, it's... I, I never had that experience. Every time I showed up in Washington, uh, we had a recession and went to war in the Middle East. So. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, the, so now we know what the solution is. <laughs> <laughs> we like to go to California. <laughs> so let me ask one last thing, and I'll, then we'll throw it open to all of you to ask questions. Um, I'm wondering what your perspectives are on the role of objective information on the sort of research that Ned did that you folks have done, uh, the role of that in policymaking. So one view that I hear is that it is uh, less uh, useful than it uh, used to be because there is this uh, a more entrenched partisan divide. More people listen to the TV station or radio station or look at the cable news site of their choice so that there's a greater drumbeat of uh, non-objective information and thus that the sort of objective research that we do and that Ned did is less important. There's also a view that I hear that, well, particularly in an environment where much of what is coming across the airwaves uh, and across uh, our computer screens and phone screens and so on is not real analysis, that that makes the analysis even more important than it used to be. Um, do you have a sense of that or, or maybe a sense about how we all could make this um, research, this policy research more relevant than it is? So, I, I mean, th this is a true story. This, uh, this constitutes minor confession. Um, uh, I left Columbia, uh, I left uh, Princeton, got a job at Columbia University, and I, I taught there for uh, three years, and I, I published in places that you never, you know, these weird exotic journals that you can't find on newsstands and seem to go off into this netherworld. And I, I watched, you know, I taught my classes and watched my students arrange their social lives in front of me, pretty indifferent to what I was saying. And I, I got seriously depressed about whether I'd chosen the right profession. Was there any social value to this at all? So in a crisis, you always go home. So I went back to Princeton for a year. And um, then my advisors had genuinely been life crises, and we, they went off to Washington, and I followed them, Harvey Rosen and John Taylor. And um, I, I never intended to go back to academia. I thought, I've had it. This is a pointless exercise. And the production of this research was not worth it. And then I found out was that at the White House, people could and did say anything in the pursuit of their favorite policies. You know, if you cut the capital gains tax rate, we will never have teen pregnancy again. <laughs> I'm sure of it. And I learned that the only check on this was not any single paper, but was the vast accumulation of genuine, serious research, which could not tell you the answer, but, but could tell you definitively many things were not the answer and could give you the boundaries of, of, of what effective policies might be. It was the most important thing that I learned there. And, um, it, it renewed my faith in the, the entire enterprise. I went back to Syracuse for a long time, and I, and, I, and I think about that a lot because it's still true. You know, I know there's a lot of competitor information out there that isn't as good, but um, uh, it, it is what the, the foundation of the policy process, and um, I think that the second lesson I've learned over time is these high-quality productions do not sell themselves, and we have to be better at communicating them. Uh, and there's no doubt about that, that the, the, in the end, what I've learned is that you have to make good policy good politics, and you have to be able to talk in English to non-specialists, cognizant of the political environment, for that, for that research to have a voice. And that becomes the challenge. And, and so th the stakes have been raised, but I don't think they've been raised by the competitor research. It's about conveying in a very noisy environment what your research says. On this dimension, uh, and I think there's been a, a fundamental transformation over the last 30 years. Uh, and what uh, people who question uh, the uh, uh, impact of uh, 
policy research, objective policy research don't understand is that its main contribu contribution is to stop bad things from happening. Uh, and a whole lot of bad things have been stopped. You know, I used to people say, what is CBO? And I said, well, CBO really is a speed bump on the uh, road of fiscal irresponsibility. Uh, that, you know, if you choose to drive your car down at 100 miles an hour, uh, you can. No one's going to stop you. Uh, you're going to have to replace the springs and the brakes and everything else a lot sooner. Uh, but the amount of stuff that CBO stops when they do an informal ca ca cost estimate for some member who has a great idea in his head uh, and it ve it's very attractive uh, politically is uh, really quite substantial. But the other thing that's happened is uh, we have peopled the um, media, the elite media, the New York Times, the, uh, you know, even the CNNs of the world, with wannabe analysts uh, who can judge good stuff from bad stuff, who appreciate their contacts with uh, people in places like, the, uh, like CBO and uh, analytical departments uh, everywhere. I mean, I spent a huge amount of time, and I'm sure all of you did, talking to people in the press, not for quotation, but sort of like, you know, I have this study that says, you know, the sky's going to fall tomorrow, and this one says the sea's going to dry up. You know, what, what's the right story? Uh, and walk me through it, and then they're very appreciative because they seem so smart uh, afterwards. And, uh, you know, if you take a newspaper, uh, an elite newspaper from, you know, 25 years ago versus now, and look and see what's in it. I mean, they all have uh, health sections, and the health sections are all reporting, uh, you know, summaries that are really well written about what's in JAMA and various uh, medical, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, bringing uh, information forward uh, that uh, educates uh, the public. And so I, I think this is all well worth it. And, and coming back to Ned, uh, Ned was sort of uniquely capable of taking complex ideas and, and explaining them to people who are interested uh, but have no uh, real expertise. Uh, and he was a great sort of teacher and communicator in that. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have talked about this book he wrote, you know, 100 pages long, and yet, uh, you know, it can be understood by anybody. Uh, it has all the right uh, messages coming through. So I, you know, more. Uh, yeah. Well, I think all of that is true, but I also think that we policy analysts uh, should put a dose of uh, modesty into what we do. Uh, policy analysis is uh, a science of sorts, but it's also a lot of art, too. And, and we do know that uh, very good conservative economists and looking at something like the employment effect of the minimum wage will come out with a different answer than very good liberal economists. And it's pretty predictable. So the Congress gets a lot of very different views that appear uh, to be scientifically based. Now the science does restrict the range of views. That's the good thing about it. Um, but I always look at it like a uh, the various expert witnesses you have uh, in some court cases where the jury has to decide, you know, between one or the other. Um, so I don't think we should get too arrogant about all of this. But again, I return to the point that the science at least restricts the range of output outcomes. Uh, CBO always takes something in the middle there somewhere. <laughs> uh, but the standard deviation can be very large. And at the bottom of it all, when it comes to the things like macro forecasting or revenue forecasting, uh, unfortunately, we're not very good at it. Um, one, one thing within economics, um, the statistical analysis that has become much more complex, so the average individual and I would include the average economist may, may find many articles inaccessible that may be dealing with very important issues and they may have a very good way of doing it, but it's just not something that's accessible. So you do need some sort of intermediaries, <laughs> like a CBO, who can read the articles and um, explain what it is 
that they, they are saying. And um, it's, it's hard to say, well, evaluate it, like the minimum wage studies are, you know, a good example, although there I strongly believe that demand curves are downward sloping, so I, I, I always reject something that suggests otherwise. But um, um, the, um, but the that, that is a barrier, you know, the, uh, and I think to get hired in universities, you have to demonstrate that you can do these, uh, do very complex statistical kinds of analysis. So I think in that way, Bob, your point about the reporters who are reading the JAMA articles and distilling them with guidance perhaps from, off the record guidance from various people can help to be, do some of that in between step that you, yeah. that you talk about. June. I spend more of my time talking to reporters not for, as Bob described, I spend most of my days talking to reporters not for attribution, but because they just, they'll call up and say, I'm going to work on this. Who are the five people I ought to talk to? You know, I don't understand what, what these issues are. And, and that's all just a legacy of having gotten to know them at some point during this process. Okay, so um, your turn. What questions would you like to put to uh, the folks up here? Well, I have more if you don't ask any, but <laughs> really it's time for you all. Um, Jean. So since we have a current and all these former CBO directors, I'd be curious what you think a CBO could do better uh, and you can add the caveat if it had the additional resources. Doug and I have a, an ongoing conversation about are there ways to put together packages, for instance, of changes as opposed to one at a time uh, that might, say, solve problems like regressivity, which shouldn't be the only criteria. You could make something progressive by combining two things together, or, or should they be doing more graphics? Uh, we tried to help them out by making them understand, at Urban Institute, to understand the importance of biographics by hiring away one of their top graphics or yeah. person yes. recent. So, yes, thanks but, for your help, Gene. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, I, but I'd be very curious uh, among you there. I mean, what, what are the things in, in your ideal world which would, do you think CBO could perhaps do better? You, have, you all have to talk and I'll take notes. <laughs> one of the things with a limited amount of time, it really is, um, and, and a, a huge array of, of topics, it's really very hard. I, 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 it's, it's hard for me to think of anything, I, you know. And I think the CBO has done better. You know, you're very, you know, you put out this, you know, huge volume of material. I mean, maybe it could be better sifted through if you wanted to draw people's attention to some things rather than other things. So, because I was hunting for something in the CBO <laughs> website, and I knew that I'd seen it, but I couldn't remember where. So. <laughs> Well, CBO does have to be careful not to do too much they're not asked for from the Congress. I mean, they tread dangerous ground if they analyze policies that nobody wants analyzed. Um, but uh, I'm glad June mentioned the website. <laughs> I have a lot of comments about that. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of papers. <laughs> well, it doesn't stay I think, well, Gene and I have often discussed different ways of displaying budget data, which shouldn't get them into trouble, but uh, things like a uh, sources and uses of funds table that just in nominal terms showed uh, where the money comes from and, the, well, where the increase in revenues every year and in borrowing uh, is allocated. Uh, to various mandatory programs and discretionary programs and so forth, I think would would show more clearly uh, the results as as Jean would say of the laws passed by dead men long ago, um, and put them on a more equal basis with uh, discretionary spending. I think I think right now the playing field is so uneven between the discretionary accounts and the, and the entitlement accounts, where the latter are not. Uh, looked at uh, and uh, the uh, built-in growth is accepted as a baseline when uh, you really don't have to do that. There are other ways of displaying it. I'm not complaining about how you display it now. It's more suggesting alternative ways of looking at it. Do you have any suggestions for us, Bob? <laughs> Okay, other questions. Uh, yes, sir. 
I'm curious about the interrelationship with OMB and CBO and how often you interact with things and is it congenial, is it conflicting, is it overlapping? So I, I think the answer is it depends a lot on the era. Um, I, I was at CBO at a time when uh, they had given up all pretense of fiscal discipline. There were, I mean, there was there were no, so there were no big disagreements that mattered on how you scored things. We weren't going to run up against a cap. We weren't going to have you know have a grandmother and Hollings enforcement mechanism. When those are in place, as they were during the ten years of someone to my left here, uh, OMB and CBO could could get in more conflict. I, I had a very benign. Uh, period, and it was characterized largely by staff-level conspiracy to make sure that I didn't know what was going on, and Mitch Daniels didn't know what was going on. It was all good. <laughs> um, when I was director, uh, there was the uh, Clinton health care proposal, uh, and uh, we were developing a lot of models. We were developing a lot of data. Uh, they were as well. Uh, at the staff level, and uh, a few times I was involved in this, uh, our people would meet informally uh, and very collegially uh, to make sure the other side knew what, uh, uh, you know, the other, not the other side, but I mean, what they knew what we were doing, and they were a little more reticent to uh, uh, show us what they were doing, but, you know, we were different on, on certain things, and uh, for a highly contentious issue, it was uh, a constructive relationship. When, um, when I came to uh, CBO, there was, in fact, very little discussion between OMB and CBO on particular things, even when there was disagreements about outlay rates or, or cost estimates. Uh, the one good thing that I think Graham Rudman really did, it forced us to work together and it forced the staff to work together. And uh, as Bob said, I think in that time period, uh, we developed collegial relationships and, and learned a lot from each other, uh, especially uh, identifying differences and assumptions for cost estimates and so forth. In the mid-90s, that was when uh, Clinton was president and Newt Gingrich was running the show, um, there was a budget impasse. You know, there were the shutdowns and um, a snowstorm, which made it seem that the shutdowns were even longer, but it was shut down because of the snow. But anyway, there was, it looked like no budget would be passed. Um, the complaint was that the CBO estimates, the um, Clinton complained that the CBO estimates were faulty, and he said the suggestion was made that we ought to have sort of a general meeting of the economists from the White House. It wasn't OMB, but the economists from the White House with the economists at, at CBO. And we did meet. It was a perfectly cordial meeting. You know, so all the main guys were there. There was Joe Stiglitz and Larry Summers and so on. And um, we talked about different things. You know, the, they were also pondering, you know, how, how significant is the, what are we missing in productivity growth? Um, and then we went about and did a new forecast. But the other thing that happened, it's a little reminiscent of the period today, weather-wise. It was, a, it was, the weather was terrible, which I think had really slowed growth during the winter in the 90s. And come the spring, I had a feeling that the thing would improve anyway, but uh, so we we did a new forecast, and the new forecast was somewhat more optimistic than the old one. It, end, it ended everything. The um, um, the you know the White House accepted our numbers, and we went along. And then it became unnecessary because the economy was booming. No one was complaining <laughs> about um, about the growth in the economy. And actually, one funny thing is when the, when it started out. One of the disagreements was the contract for America said that the budget sh would be balanced in seven years. And Clinton came back, said that would be inhumane. We couldn't have anything to, to achieve a balanced budget in seven years would cause such draconian cuts that couldn't be done. And then, of course, the budget, there was a surplus within three years, so, which just goes to show. <laughs> 
<laughs> Over the years, um, as CBO's reputation uh, has risen, uh, increasingly you have gotten people at the secretarial level and the high level political appointees um, in the situation where when CBO comes out with something that's very different from what they, their staff has done, they ask their staff, what's the difference? Uh, and so I think there's more communication at uh, a low level uh, as things go on, sort of where are you on this, uh, higher or lower than this? I mean, no, nobody puts their cards on the table, but uh, there's relationships that are developed and uh, sort of an understanding of uh, nobody wants surprises. And, and the, and the uh, estimates and forecasts have converged as well. Yeah. I mean, during my time there, we were contending with the so-called reagan rosie scenarios where there was big differences in the short-run forecasts. Uh, but uh, the press tended to side with us uh, on, on the debates that ensued. And I think over the years, uh, uh, as a result of that, uh, administrations have been much more reluctant to diverge uh, from the uh, consensus kind of estimate, which is the kind of estimate that CBO is likely to put forth. I would just add, in the current era, um, the analysts of CBO are in, in, interact with the counterparts at OMB and in the various agencies that are implementing the programs they're studying. Um, but we have very uh, limited, next to no contact at a senior level. Um, I don't talk to the OMB director um, because I think there is uh, a risk of looking like we are collaborating in some way, and um, given the current level of distrust um, among the folks I work for, um, that seems like a, a risk not worth taking. Um, other questions? Um, David. So the CBO itself was a important institutional innovation in the mid-1970s. One thing I talked with uh, Ned about quite a bit was whether there were other potential institutional innovations. I sort of doubt that we've arrived at the uh, end state, uh, the best answer about fiscal institutions uh, in the United States. And I'm curious for your thoughts about potential fiscal uh, institutions that might re improve the state of policymaking uh, in the United States today. So I, I have re reluctantly, after years of op uh, opposition, come around to the notion that we may want to move to something that is a budget resolution signed by the president. Call it whatever you want. I mean, the reality is that the federal government doesn't have a budget. I mean, the, the president has his proposals. The House sometimes passes a budget resolution. The Senate sometimes passes a budget resolution. They sometimes conference and agree. But never do all three parties get on the same page. Never is there a comprehensive plan for what you'll spend, discretionary and mandatory, what you'll borrow and what you'll raise in taxes. It just doesn't exist. So, you know, we don't have fiscal policy. We have fiscal outcomes, usually bad. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I can tell you a million reasons why this is a bad idea, but it would force people to talk to each other again, which I think is a good idea, and it would force us to actually come to terms with the plan. Um, So <laughs> you write down a budget every year or every other year to take your pick, and the House passes it, the Senate passes it, and the President signs it. And you have to have that before you can do any appropriations. But that's all he does. And then what? It's, dead, it's, dead, it's dead on arrival. You hear that you read the press reports, dead on arrival, doesn't matter. House passes its budget, dead on arrival in the Senate. Senate may or may not pass its budget. Never do all three. There's nothing that forces all three to get together and actually have a plan. Well, unless you're going to have a fallback of some kind, yeah. that something automatically I, becomes I, I know, the budget. I've for years, but uh, I know. <laughs> yeah, no, oh, okay. I what are we going to do? <laughs> I'm with, I mean, I'm with you. There are a thousand yeah. reasons why this might not work, but we need something. When you have different, different parties in the two houses, it makes it much more difficult, though. You know, if, if one is Republican and one is a Dem Democratic, yeah, that makes it hard. I was there when, when they were all Republicans. It was still pretty difficult. So, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> um, okay. Other questions? 
Yes, the woman in the back. Well, so I, can say, so I can say what we've done recently. So on, the, on, on your first topics, um, we, um, have, we publish a report every year about the distribution of income and taxes uh, paid. And last fall, we, for the first time, also published the distribution of federal spending. So you can look at the federal spending and taxes together and get a sense of the overall impact of the federal budget on the distribution of, of income. Uh, and on climate change, we've done a succession of work over the last decade or dozen years or so um, that has really, I think, done a terrific job of analyzing a set of alternative policies and their consequences for economic growth, for uh, distribution of well-being, um, as well as for the federal budget. On the Social Security, I would say, uh, you know, again, if you can find your way through our website, the, uh, <laughs> there's um, a very nice report uh, analyzing uh, collection of options for dealing with Social Security. As you know, we don't make recommendations. We just present the men. We offer the menu. We don't tell you, well, tonight the chicken is especially good. Um, but that is one of the options. And we look at the effects not only on the federal budget, but also on the effects on the benefits pay received and taxes paid by people born in different uh, generations uh, and with different levels of income during their lifetimes. I mean, there's a lot of simple answers to these questions, and they tend to be politically unacceptable. Um, you know, I, I don't think raising the tax cap will get you there, but, uh, you know, it'll get you a long way there. And, uh, you know, the downside of that is there are not many people <laughs> who would sign on to it. Um, and there's a crucial question of whether you'd continue to compute benefits yeah. the way you uh, do now. And uh, a lot of strong advocates of the Social Security system think that if you broke the relationship between taxes paid and benefits uh, earned, as it were, uh, that that would hurt the political strength of the system. Okay, uh, Jim. CPO has uh, stood for two propositions that are propositions that economics stands for also, which is that uh, policies have incentive effects and that there's a budget constraint. And these two propositions tend to make CPO the bad guy in you know, most policy discussions. Um, query, is that inevitable? I mean, are you guys just the bad guys? Uh, and is there a way to make yourself the good guys? And if so, would then the message be more effective, or is that just impossible to do? I, I think you're the bad guy. I mean, I, as you know, I spent two years of my life on the, on the McCain campaign, and there is nothing more unpleasant than being the policy person on a political campaign, because it's your job to say things like, well, that's not true, or you can't say that, and they hate you. I mean, they just hate you. And um, so, yeah, they're always going to be the bad guy because they're, they are, you know, in that position. All you can do is try to ameliorate it by saying, look, sir, I know you're the politician and I'm the policy analyst. Here's what I know about this. You're now informed. You're, you know, you're, you're an adult with an armed gun. Go do what you want to do. Um, but but this, is, this is what you're about to say. And, but you're the bad guy, no doubt about it. I'm surprised that you think that CBO is now considered a bad guy. I from where I sit, usually, I mean, in the press, CB, CBO is considered God, uh, like the word of CBO oh, the, is like Moses, right? Yeah, I know. I know where you're coming from. Remember, some of that's uh, artificial, too. I mean, I always thought one of my roles, I don't know how the others feel about it, is you, you, so you have this psychosocial role of being the person they can blame for their troubles, and, and they vent and scream and yell and lie a lot about how CEO didn't have the, the scores done on time and, oh, my oh, God, Congress it's just, it's just all wrong. 
But uh, you get called by members and uh, committee chairs and things like that, excoriating you, you know, for what has happened, and then you run into the person in some uh, less heated environment, and they say, you know, I'm so thankful for CBO. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it's it's like a kid, you know, blowing up, but then realizing that boundaries have to be set, and uh, you know, most of these. Uh, individuals, uh, they're smart, they're capable, and, um, you know, they're appreciative of what CBO does, I think. And, and one of the interesting things going on now is that you're having uh, many CBOs pop up all over the world, even in Westminster parliamentary systems where you wouldn't think they would have that big a role, but uh, there's a new, relatively new one in Canada now that serves the parliament. and. Uh, uh, people like them because uh, in a parliamentary system, the minority has a terrible time getting any information at all, and the and, uh, CBO-type organization does provide them with some expertise. People come to visit us um, uh, from other countries to talk about how they might set up institutions like ours. Uh, from Australia, for example, we were visited by a delegation of people in the parliamentary majority, and a, separately, on a different occasion, a delegation of people in the parliamentary minority, both trying to understand how, how if they adopted something like CBO, it would work. Um, Bob Sunshine, who's the deputy director and is here in the front, um, has gone to conferences in other countries and explains how we do what we do. Now, we're forced to confess that it's not like U.S. fiscal policy has turned out all that <laughs> impressively, so you shouldn't think this, you should, well, that's true, that's the, that's the point, which is that um, is having an organization Having CBO or an organization like CBO is not uh, like having a magic wand to solve your budget problems, but I, I do think very strongly that the absence of an organization that can produce objective numbers um, would make the current situation far, far worse. Um, I think I will, since I am currently working for the Congress, I think I will not offer any further characterization <laughs> of my relationship with them. I have to wait for my memoirs. Um, maybe we have time for one more, one more quick question, please. Well, CBO has very good information on the uh, budget allocations at the, at the federal government. But, um, of course, there's a lot of other governments that are spending a lot of money in the, in the United States, and they have implications for, you know, as we've already talked about, fiscal policy as well as uh, many other policy issues that Ned was interested in. Is there any interest in members among members of Congress to have CBO do more to sort of upgrade the quality of the information that we have about state and local government budgets? So that question is asked uh, occasionally, and our answer is simply we study the federal budget. And um, I think there are organizations in some, I mean, in states, some of greater strength than others, that do analysis, somewhat analogous to what CBO does. Um, but I think we don't have, and we've done a little work in that area. Um, we've looked at state and local pensions a bit. Um, we, look, we look obviously at the state side of the programs that are shared with the federal government. Um, so we talk to some extent about how Medicaid changes will affect the states. Um, but that, that would be a huge, that would be a huge project, um, well beyond what we could possibly achieve in the current situation. Okay, so we've come to 515, um, and we should stop here. And I don't know if Susan or Paul have more to say at this point. Thank you all very much. Clearly these are very important, but particularly challenging issues. I think, uh, and many of you who are here knew Ned much better than I did, but I suspect that if he were here, he would tell us that we've got a lot of work to do, and it's time for us to roll up our sleeves, but as Sheldon said in the very first panel, but we shouldn't lose our optimism. And so with that, um, I'd like to particularly thank Ruth Gramlich for joining us for today, as well as a number of the members of the Gramlich family. Um, I'd also like to thank our hosts, the Federal Reserve. It's been wonderful to work with them, and um, we really appreciate all of the hospitality and the partnership. 
this conference would not have happened without a lot of hard work from both Fed staff as well as Ford School staff. And I wanted to particularly express appreciation for the great work that they did to have everything go so smoothly. And then last but not least, in addition to thanking you, our audience, for joining us, I wanted to ask all of you to join me in a round of applause to thank our moderators and all of the panelists for the entire session. So thank you very, very much. There is a reception, and I invite you to stay.